So of course we open up with the Alliance being down about, you know. We get Adora lumping full responsibility onto herself as she was the one who suggested this and is not hearing Bo's attempts to try to dissuade that notion. It's a pattern of behavior Adora will carry for a long time. Especially when they get back to Bright Moon, she's even ready to, to explain to Angela that Entrapta's death was entirely her fault. More on that later. Maybe there's a reason the Princess Alliance fell apart before. Being together makes us vulnerable. You know, I could see why the first Princess Alliance fell apart if their parents were anything like their kids. You had one casualty and suddenly you're gonna give up and lock yourselves away. Also, we have this moment where Angela meets Adora, Bo, and Glimmer on the bridge and is hugging the ladder, yet after the intro, they're inside the palace. Like, did Angela maintain that position and they like shuffled inside? This isn't me firing flack. I just have this mental image of the two just slowly shifting across that bridge into the palace and then Glimmer then decides to pull out her mother's embrace. I just think it's kind of funny. You usually teleport out of my embraces. What's going on? Recall that Glimmer lost her ability to teleport breaking out of the Black Gum restraints. Well, now she's trying to hide it, because reasons? Okay, I know why. It's Glimmer's idea that her own mother doesn't think she's capable of bubbling up and doesn't want her to be disappointed. Also, it's gone from unable to teleport to these glitches, as they call them. It's happening more often. Does it hurt? No, Bo. She's screaming in pain because that's how she likes it always feel better after I recharge, so... So Glimmer brushes off telling her mother just because she thinks there's some easy solution to this whole situation. I mean, we've all been there as kids. We've all at some point or another been in a situation where we just don't want our parents to know about something we caused, and so we just try to just shove it under the rug, solve it on our own, and just be done and gone with the whole situation, yet it doesn't end up going as such here. Just needed to re <laughs> Angela's behavior is also as understandable as Glimmer's. You saw what she was like last episode, and now Glimmer's just dodging any attempt to talk. So her daughter was just taken hostage, looks to be in terrible condition, and just lost someone in a rescue attempt. Angela just wants to be there, but can't mainly because Glimmer just has this misconception about her mother's view on her. I just wanted to talk. And Angela Ajit has to resort to just using her status as a monarch just to get Glimmer to come at alone at dinner. It's a serious lack of communication and an unfortunate situation that I believe has been growing over the course of years. Meanwhile, Shadow Warrior is just getting hammered by Hordak. Invite attack from an enemy with detailed knowledge of our operations. What was the plan last episode? They didn't have extra security around Bo or Glimmer, nor were they prepared for an attack. It looked like Shadow Weaver made zero preparations either because she didn't anticipate a door would come, or she did and just hoped things would meander along and end up in Adora's capture or something? Oh yeah, and here's Entrapta like four minutes into the episode. I am glad they weren't trying to perform some sort of stupid balancing act between having the characters know and trying to hide things for some grand reveal that wouldn't be surprising later. She just immediately gets sniffed down and captured the next scene we have in the Fright Zone. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's concrete. Scorpia, please. Okay, it is now later. A door can turn into an eight foot tall warrior woman that has done much, but has been shown not to be some be all end all solution. Adora tried being the hero her friends needed, and it resulted in Glimmer's condition and entrapped as loss. I haven't been training enough, and look what happened! She didn't train hard, so she failed. This is her mistake. So she ends up. Heading out to the Whispering Woods for answers on Shira's healing abilities to work to fix Glimmer. I mean, she tries really hard to heal Glimmer, yet failure is all that awaits her because she doesn't really understand this power. It is all partially because she just wants to help her friend, but mostly because she still blames herself and trying to heal Glimmer is the only way she can quote-unquote redeem herself for quote-unquote failing. Running off alone, probably because she doesn't want anyone getting hurt because of her decision, like uh, last time. No. I have to do this on my own. Ah! I'm sorry, but every time we've seen outside of Glimmer's window, it's always been a sheer drop. Yet here it sounds as if a door just fell a few feet and hit a tree or bush. Inconsistent is what we'll call minor details within this show. Also, we have Bo here just tidying up Glimmer's room like the moment she tosses something to the floor. Bo is really trying to be the straight man here. Like, they're trying to discuss how Shira's healing works and Glim's all... Maybe it's like a motion. Like a jabbing motion or a strike. And Bo's here just trying to keep things from getting out of hand. It 
Do you want to get hit with a sword? Glimmer just continues to try and brush off her condition as if it's no big deal, even though it's shown to be becoming a big deal. As if losing her main powers is just okay. I'll nap! I bet when I wake up, I'll be good as new. Yeah! It's just Charles attempts to put a situation on the back burner and forgetting about it until an easy solution comes along. Ugh, why did I make my bed so high? I don't know, Glimmer. Why did you remove the stairs to let up to the bed? Back with Entrapta, captured by the Horde and about to be interrogated by Catra, you'd think she'd be taking things a bit more serious. Ooh, what's that? What? <laughs> you would be wrong. Also, why did they bother binding her hair up like that? Did they seriously think that would work? It's hair. And Trapta doesn't even need to pick the lock on it to get it out of there. <laughs> what is the purpose of this? And Trapta is also like immediately willing to answer Catra's question, like no issue to what she was doing here. I was just waiting for my friends to get back. I'd make it easier for them and just stay- And right here we have another moment where Catra's clever side comes out. Like, they left you. No, no, they're my friends! Like, she knows Adora and the rest left and trapped her there. Some friends. They left you and they're not coming back. And Trapta legitimately believes that they're coming back. And Catra knows better and spins a story. Adora got her precious bow and glimmer back, care about his people who are just like them. She uses like pathos to establish a personal connection to Entrapta's newfound situation. She left me behind too, like I was nothing. Catra has only met Entrapta like once before this at Princess Prom, yet from that brief moment and for what you can see here, she's able to uncover and exploit an insecurity of hers. This angry feline person seems to be correct. They're not coming back for me. What I appreciate the most of this is how much of a gamble Catra is making with her words. She doesn't know if Entrapta would see it the way she's presenting it. But that possibility of failure gives this organic feel to the moment because Catra really was improvising this on the spot. And once Entrapta is in a vulnerable state, Catra moves in with her pitch. Be something you're not with the Horde. Think of what you could accomplish here. And again, it was a gamble that only worked because Entrapta spent enough time here to pick apart a bot and learn how much better a place like the Fright Zone is to experiment with technology. The interrogation goes casual and Katra even says she's impressed with what Entrapta is able to achieve. Then the conversation goes to the first ones. First what? Yeah, of course Katra wouldn't know who they are. And Entrapta hands over a pad that she believes will lead to a large stash of first one's tech. And, of course, Catra immediately goes out because, well, she wants to impress Hordak with whichever Entrapa can make from it. Thumbs up for the fast thinking, manipulation, and seizing an opportunity so soon after the last one's credit was stolen by Shadow Weaver. But I'm gonna add one to the Reckless Counter because Catra decides to head out to the Whispering Woods, a place known to the Horde to have people constantly disappear in there by herself. Like, like not even bringing Scorpia into the- a place the Rebellion owns. There's also this one moment where in comes Shadow Weaver. She is of course reluctant to say where she is going and at first acts her usual snarky self until Catra turns to see the state her adoptive mother is. Don't worry about that thing with Hordak. I've got loads of experience being yelled at. Sympathy quickly takes over. We saw this once before back in episode 4. The genuine tone here really caught me off guard when I first saw this. It was the first time I really started to question what relationship Catra has with Shadow Weaver. I was hard on you, and I won't apologize. I just wanted to prepare you for the world. It's definitely abusive, yet there is also this underlying need from Catra to have some sort of approval and acceptance from Shadow Waver, and I'm still going at it with a set square to figure out why. Besides that, it seems like I forgot there was resolution for the drama from Bo and Glimmer during prom, but it isn't much of one. It's Bo starting off by trying to take the blame and saying he never should have gone with Perfuma to prom as if he doesn't have the choice to do that. Then Glimmer saying, no, no, I never should have been weird about it, which is definitely true. Then they hug and that's your lot. All that complex and relatable drama about drifting friends and being clingy about the old ways and unable to accept things like change. And it ends in one of the corniest ways possible. Like, as soon as the moment ended, I knew why I mentally tossed this out. It looks so quick. And finally, we get an actual talk between mother and daughter. Angela is just trying to help with the trauma she believes Glimmer to have. I mean, yeah, she was in this horrible situation. Yet, once more, all Glimmer understands it as Angela thinking she's incapable. Get it, Mom! I failed! This whole scene is an overdue communicata between them, and it shows how much baggage there is. I'm sorry I couldn't be perfect like you! 
and all Angela can really say back to any of this is I don't know how you feel. I got your father killed. It's like I said last episode, Angela does not want Glimmer in any situation where she needs to make a hard choice because the last major decision she made regarding the war got her own husband killed. I've never forgiven myself. So she kept Glimmer back and let her have some freedom though. She didn't make her own daughter a commander and sends her out knowing full well the first sign of combat she's going to be jumping in. Yet that aspect was never seen by Glimmer. I was ashamed. I acted without thinking. They're always telling me not to do. That shame at failure led her to, well, suffer in silence trying anything other than just talking to her own mother about a problematic situation she's in. All because she feels shame about being a quote-unquote failure. This seems to be understood by Angela, who tells how this situation is a lot her fault for letting the old alliance fall apart because of her grief, and encourages Glimmer to try and maintain this one. Even powerless, this scene needs to be experienced in person, like there's no substitute, it's great. It's a combination of what we've seen previously between these two, all coming to a head and being partially resolved through like some actual communication between them. The remainder of the episode is just Adora coming back to the place where Raz took her back in Ep 3, assuming there will just be some answers there. Katra following the map and trap to gave her, spotting and stalking close behind, all in preparation for the next episode, and that's where we get some serious progression between these two. So that was episode 10 of Overanalyzing She-Ra. If you like this video and want to see more, hit that thumbs up and the subscribe button, then bell to get notifications about the next episode. I'll try to update this series every Thursday, so please share it with other fans, and also check out my channel for my video essays, music analysis videos, and complex character series. You might find them enjoyable as well.